So anyhow, the, the message title is Salt and Light, and I kept looking for those little packets, you know, you get at the restaurants, and I didn't go and steal a whole bunch. So I didn't, I didn't get them, but um, I did get the salt shaker. And, um, excuse me, while I get my other illustration, <laughs> it fell. I, I'll, I'll get to that later. <laughs> salt and light. Well, anyhow, um, it's hard for, I mean, it's, it's, on Wednesday night, we were, like I said, we were doing the, the movie uh, Paul, the apostle. And many said, well, it, it was hard to imagine you know, seeing the film puts it in a whole different perspective, the, the time period and, you know, Paul being in prison and the persecution that was going on in the Roman Empire. You know, um, Nero had burnt Rome and he was mad enough to think, mentally mad enough to think that the people of Rome would really like him for it. And when he found out the people didn't like him for it, well, he blamed the Christians, <laughs> And so the Christians then became the target of the vengeance of the Roman people and the Roman Empire. So um, Paul was the greatest leader at that time in, in the church and in the area. So Paul gets arrested and thrown in prison. And so the movie goes on about these things and about the persecution uh, where they took Christians and doused them in oil and put them on poles in the streets and lit them up for flares and lights in the streets, and, you know, the persecution was severe. Well, it's hard for us to kind of put ourselves in that framework until, you know, until you think about or see a movie such as this, and of course, it's not 100% um, biblical, but it's very, very much, uh, if you know the story of Paul, it very much is pretty authentic with uh, some of the outcomes and some of the some of the situations that we find recorded. Well, last week we did the, did the um, well, let's back up a little bit. Back up before last week. Um, if you try to put our, if we try to put ourselves within the framework of the people that Jesus was coming to, we know that in 1445, I believe it was, uh, BC, that that's whenever Moses received the Ten Commandments. And from that time period on, we have the different prophets and priests and kings of Israel coming clear up to the last book of the Bible, Malachi. And from Malachi to the book of Matthew, there's 400 years in which there isn't anyone. There's no word from the Lord in 400 years. So they are very steeped in tradition. They are very steeped in their keeping of the laws and keeping of the commandments. They haven't heard from God, so the people at the time felt like they had to, they had to make people understand you've got to keep the commandments, you've got to obey all laws, and there were so many laws, nobody could keep them, you know? There were so many rituals and cleansings, and th they had kept adding to the 10, had gone to maybe 1,500 commandments. I mean, it was totally ridiculous. And then there was corruption in the, in the uh, temple and in the priesthood, you know, it had become so, such a moneymaker for some of them, you know, I'm sure not all of them were corrupt and things, but there was a, just a lot of corruption going on in the, in the early, ch in the uh, Jewish temple at that time. And then the Romans had come in and, and it was just, a, it was just a chaos. The people were enslaved to a, another nation. They had to watch out for the Romans and uh, they, had to, they couldn't go to the temple and trust in their priests and their Levites and their, their Pharisees, the people who were leading. And it was just, just a lot of chaos going on. So if you think about being at that time period and you think about what God had put in place through Moses, and this is, this is all good. Jesus did not come to abolish the law he came to fulfill it. So when Jesus comes along, we find him saying, that's all true, and now it has come to this. Now we are moving to another, a new era, a new testament, a new covenant. There was an old covenant under Abraham and under Moses and you know, the laws. Now there is a new covenant under, under, uh, under Christ. So if you think about the, the laws, okay? It says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt where you were slaves. So it begins with God 
and how God had delivered them. Very important, we remember that. How God had delivered them from the slavery of the Egyptians. In our lives, God delivers us from the slavery of sin, from the slavery of a humanistic perspective of our life. So, you must have no other gods before me. Okay, so God says, nobody else, just me, no graven images. So, the, the Jewish people and the temple and all that, they're very, very staunch. You know, they can't have anything that may symbolize something of their religion, and they did approve the, the Star of David, but that was different. That's a different sermon. You must have no other gods. You must not make for yourselves an idol that looks like anything in the sky uh, above or on the earth below. Um, you must not use the name of the Lord your God in vain, thoughtlessly. <laughs> um, we could use a lot of that around today. Remember the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother. And you know, um, that's the only promise. It says, honor your father and mother so that you will live a long life, a long time in the land of the Lord your God is going to give you. So it's the only, it's one of the promise, it's one of the only commandment with promise. Honor your parents. God will bless you with a long life. Uh, you must not murder. You must not be guilty of adultery. You must not steal. You must not tell lies. <laughs> Sometimes I have a hard time reading the newspaper and watching TV. You know, just change the channel and you hear totally different stories. What's going on? Uh, who knows? You must not covet your neighbor's house. Now, there's, there's a good one. Covet. We, um, you know... If you got a brand new car <laughs> and, uh, and uh, somebody else comes along and says, you know, I want a car just like that. That's not coveting. Coveting is, I really like your car. I want yours. <laughs> I want you to give that up and give it to me. Well, why don't you go one just like it? No, 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 no. I have to take it from you. See, that's coveting. And so whenever we get in that situation where we're trying to take, not only get something like, that's all right, you know. No, it's all right to get something like someone, not keeping up with the Joneses, you know, not that type of thing. But to, to go and purchase something like, that's all right. Good taste, <laughs> copy, you know, that's all right. So um, you must not cover your neighbor's house, his goods, his wife, his servants, his donkeys, <laughs> you know. You don't want to steal any of those. So Moses, whenever all of this took place, you know, because we had the Ten Commandments, and when all this took place, the people came to Moses whenever he came from the mountain, and they say, Moses, we want you to speak to us because we're afraid of God. <laughs> and if we hear from God, he will surely die. So you, you go take, you listen to what God has to say, and then you tell us. So this is kind of their image and their rhetoric and their understanding of God. You either do what I tell you to do, or you die. God is going to take care of you, and if he doesn't take care of you, we will. We'll stone you, okay? So, we got that going. So, this law was given in about 1445 B.C., and we go all that time up to 400, and so there's 1,445 years. 1,445 years from the giving of the commandments to when Jesus is born. That's a long time. We haven't been a nation. We were a nation in 1776. Okay? What was started, <laughs> look at what's happened with the uh, Constitution. <laughs> how that we, how our forefathers wrote these things down, okay? And in what, how many years? 300 years? We've been trying to change the whole thing. You know, roll out this. Well, just think about what was going on in 1,445 years. Hmm. So we're going to keep all this stuff in place. We're going to create all these laws, and we're going to do all these rituals for one purpose. Make God happy. Because if God is happy, he'll bless us. See, If you do good, you'll only receive good. 
See, it doesn't work, huh? <laughs> Something's wrong with that. Well, that was kind of the old covenant, the old way of thinking. If you do good, you get good. You do bad, you're bad. So this is what we've been studying or are going to continue to study in Sunday school with the book of Job. You know, Job was blessed beyond anyone else and he loses everything. So his friends are going to show up next week <laughs> in our study uh, and Sunday school lesson and we're going to find out what his friends think of Job. And they think that Job has been hiding a bunch of his sins and he isn't as good as everybody thinks he is. And if he was as good as everybody thought he was, then he wouldn't have problems like this. So therefore, Job is a hypocrite. <laughs> and they're always trying to get Job to, to look at himself in a different manner, to tell everybody he's really bad. Because it's evident he's bad. Look at all the bad things that happen. You see how, how that we have set in mind, or we have a mindset that interprets what we see? Do you look in the mirror and say, wow, how beautiful you are, how handsome you are? Well, why would we say that? A mindset that we have interprets what we hear and what we look at. And if we would say that, that would be foolish because we know there are better looking people than this. We know there are people who have a better, no, that's not the point. The point is that in God's eyes, we are his favorite child. I always like the one, if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. <laughs> because you're his favorite child. But see, placing yourself in that position of favorite does not push somebody else off. We're, un we're under the, um, the old mindset, you know, you have a pie. I like pies, in case you're wondering. <laughs> the old mindset is we have a pie, and everybody gets a sl slice of the pie. But if you take more than your slice of the pie, that means somebody else gets cheated. And so if you take two slices of pie, that means somebody else doesn't get their piece or their you know, allotted piece because you took too much. So we, we're under the mindset that there's only so much to go around, and if there's only so much to go around and you get too much, I'm cheated. Well, God doesn't live by that philosophy because in the kingdom of heaven, there's as much pie as you want. <laughs> because when God blesses us, he blesses us in abundance, and the more we receive of God, the more we use of God does not diminish his resources. Okay? So we see how that our mindset interprets things. Then we have Jesus coming. Now, then we have the Ten Commandments. We have all these laws, all these regulations. If you're going to do the right thing, if you're going to be accept accepted in our society and accepted by God, you've got to do what we tell you, say what we say, and live by our rules. Then God's happy and you're happy. Amen. Yes, thank you. Yeah. I don't want to do that. So, Jesus comes on the scene. He's now um, gone through his 40 days of uh, fasting and temptation by Satan. He's began to speak in Galilee, and, and he's been teaching, and people are following him. And when they follow him, there's too many of them, so he takes some of the disciples that he has already chosen, and he goes up on a mount. Thus, the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> we did this last week. Don't worry, I'm not going to preach last week's sermon, just part of it. But uh, he goes up on the mountain, and there he, he sits with the people who will make the journey up the mountain. All right? Now, imagine what's in the mindset of these people. They have been trained in obedience to the laws, ritualistic cleansings, sacrificial system, take lamb to the temple once a year, take a ghost sin offering, take it to the temple. Going through all of these rituals. They're used to all that. And in comes Jesus, and he takes them up on top of the hill, and he sat down with his followers, and he began to teach them, saying, you are blessed. <laughs> when you realize your spiritual poverty, 
wait a minute. I don't have spirituality. I have obedience. Okay? What Jesus is telling them to do is complete op- almost the complete opposite of what they've been trained and what they've been governed in. And what we are looking at here is what is our mindset of how we have been trained or we have trained ourselves? What is our mindset? And does it keep us from what Jesus is trying to tell us? Because we have our mindset. Don't confuse me with the facts. My mind's made up. (laughs) Anybody know people like that? Like some of the umpires in, in, uh, in baseball and referees in football. It's not a strike until I call it a strike. <laughs> it's not a fumble until I call it a fumble, you know? But now we have instant replay to prove, all right? So, but anyhow, instant replay. When something challenges us, what is God's word telling us? So, oh, blessed are the poor in spirit. People, blessed are the people who realize their spiritual poverty. Why are we blessed? Because we recognize spiritual poverty. Because we then access ourselves to the spirituality that we find in Christ and how that Christ comes into our life. Second, blessed are those who grieve, who mourn, for God will comfort them. Blessed are the people who have pain. Well, you see, last week, the subject of the sentence is God, not grief. Blessed are those who grieve, for God will comfort them. Everybody has grief in their life, but grief is not greater than God. God is greater than our pain. We find that in the book of Job. Next week, 9.45. What time is it? 9.45. Okay. Blessed are those who are humble, who are meek, for the whole earth will be theirs. You see, meek, we are meek are people you get stepped on. You know, you don't see meek people on a football field, you know? Look at me. I made a tackle. (laughs) (laughs) Need another picture? (laughs) You know, it's like you do something right and you you want the whole stadium to stand up and applaud. We should do something right because it's the right thing to do. But anyhow, that's just my little take on it. Blessed are the humble and meek, and we know that meekness means strength under control. Strength under control are the people who don't quit. You see, it isn't, meekness is not being the doormat. Meekness is the person who will continue to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, and they won't quit because they know it's the right thing to do, and they keep going. When the tough, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Those are meek people. The people who are boisterous and bold and in your face and telling you off, they're the ones who quit. Because who are the people that are going to go into the, to the lions? Who are the people who are going to be fed to the lions, who are going to be lit up for torches on the streets of Rome? Who are the ones who are going to be persecuted and separated from their families and thrown in prison? The meek, who will not renounce their faith. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after justice, after righteousness. We want what's just. We go after it. Blessed are those who show mercy. God is merciful. He has the ability to step on an ant. (laughs) Us. But he chooses not to. He has the power to destroy, but refuses to because of his mercy. He's trying to build. Blessed are those whose thoughts are pure. They will see God. That's what we used that in the Sunday school lesson about Job. He was perfect. We'd say, wow, without flaw. No, perfect is pure. Just that's what this this is all about here. Blessed are those whose thoughts are pure. It's interesting, and I mentioned this in Sunday school, how that 1,000, well, Job is thought to have have been written in the 15th century B.C. What Job encounters the 15th century B.C. equates to what Jesus teaches in the New Testament. They don't contradict each other. 
1,500 years before Jesus spoke, Job, who had this relationship with God, lived out what Jesus is teaching. Blessed are those who work for peace. Blessed are those who, per, who, who are persecuted for doing good. You are blessed when people insult and mock you and hurt you. They will lie and say all kinds of evil things against you because you follow Christ. Now, this is totally, I mean, think they, remember, this is the law. These are people raised in the law. These are the people who are raised in legalism. These are people who have to take sacrifices to the temple. These are the people who see the... garbage of the temple, of their lying and cheating and stealing the people. They see it, but they still have to perform these rituals in order to be safe with God. That's what they've been taught. That's their mindset. And Jesus just tells them, blessed are the meek and hurt and humbled. And Wait a minute, what's all that? Then he goes on and he says, this is, where, this is my sermon. Ready? You are the salt of the earth. Oh, wait a minute now. <laughs> I'm, I'm not salty. <laughs> I'm not salt. I am, I am legalism. I dress right, I conform right, I do right, I, I am perfect as best as I can before God and we'll just see what happens. Then Jesus says, no, blessed are the pure, blessed are those who mourn. And, but, and then he says, you are the salt of the earth. Can you see how confusing this would be for these people? There's this, this guy they're following and Jesus has called them to be his disciples and there's a whole crowd following and they go up on the mountain and most of the crowd doesn't go and so they're up there listening to this guy talk and it's called the Sermon on the Mount and he says, blessed are you when you are persecuted and then you are the salt of the earth. You're responsible for all the people on the earth. Well, wait a minute. But if salt has lost its salty taste, become tasteless, it cannot be made salty again. I wonder if Jesus was referring to the old sacrificial system. <laughs> it's lost what it was supposed to be. It's not the salt that I intended whenever we created this. When we put this system in place, this is not what it was meant to be. It has lost its effectiveness for the earth. You see, if seasoning has lost its flavor, it has no value. If Christians make no effort to change the world around them, they are of little value to God. Thus, the salt shaker. Now, I don't want you to open it. Because if you open it, then you've got to use it, then you'll spill it. So we put it on the shelf. Where's the salt? It's on the shelf. <laughs> You see, sometimes we as Christians, I'm salt, here it is. Well, is it open? Oh, no, I'll, you know, might spill it. <laughs> might spill all over something or someone, you know, whoops. You know, I was making, I was cooking hamburgers <laughs> this, about two weeks ago. And we have this seasoning for hamburgers. Me, you know, I'm professional chef that I am, I open up the container and I just dump a little bit on there because you don't want to put too much on. Well, anyhow, uh, one of the bottles, seasoning bottles that we use, you take the lid off and the container that, that you know, the sifts it is there and you just sprinkle it out. And the other one, you lift the lid and the lid stays on and you dump it out. Uh, I got confused. I took the lid off and it goes like that and the whole... <laughs> All over. I mean, I had, I had seasoning about an inch thick on this one hamburger, so I just spread it around, you know, put it on the other hamburgers and whatever, and put it in the middle. And Those hamburgers were the best I, I had. I recognized by dumping all that on there, I really achieved the flavor <laughs> of what I was longing for as a chief chef of our campsite. So... We as believers, sometimes we're, we hold back our seasoning. Just a little seasoning here. Put a little salt here. Everybody knows I'm a Christian. <laughs> but 
if there's not enough there to make a difference. We've got to understand that we are here to make a difference for Jesus Christ. And that if we do, you know, if we give too much salt, <laughs> like one guy said, he's never met an atheist. Oh, well, this was, this was years ago. We never met an atheist in a, in a foxhole. And the other one is a um, guy sitting on a, a plane and he's reading his Bible. Oh, this is, this is another one. I think of all these stories once in a while. And uh, um, one lady, she's reading the Bible and the guy says to her, do you believe in that? He says, yep. Do you believe every word in that? He says, Yep. And he says, um, what about, I think it was, I don't, maybe, what if it was Jonah? He says, do you really believe that about Jonah and the well? Yeah. He says, well, uh, and she says, yeah. He says, well, I don't believe it. And um, I forgot the story. But anyhow, <laughs> anyhow, it ends up being that uh, if you believe that stuff, and, and it goes back and forth and back and forth, and she says, well, do you think Jonah's going to be in heaven? He says, yeah. Well, what if he's not in heaven? Then, he, then she says, well, you can ask him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, it's back and forth, okay. Uh, another, this is another preacher. Another preacher, he, he's on the plane, and, uh, and the guy's saying to him, you know, do you really believe in all this and Jesus and stuff? And he says, no, I don't believe in all that stuff. I said, I bet you if the engines stop working on this plane and we go into a nosedive, I bet you believe before you hit the ground. <laughs> so, believers are the salt of the earth. It doesn't mean we do everything correctly. We are allowing the salt, which is the life of Christ, the love of Christ, the blessing of God to be poured out on people's lives. So sodium is needed to help relax and contract muscles. Did you know that? Conducts the nervous, Im the nerve impulses. I mean, salt is very much part of our life. The role of salt in the Bible. The Bible contains numerous references to salt in various contexts. It is used as metaphorically, metaphorically to signify performance, loyalty, durability, fidelity, usefulness, value, and purification. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light that gives light for the world. A city that is built on a hill cannot be hidden. Where are they at? They're in the Sermon on the Mount. They're looking over, and then Jesus said, you're the light of the world. If you are here on this hill, and your light is here, people are going to see it. You see, he says, people don't light a lamp and then hide it under a bowl, because what happens when you put a light under a bowl? It goes out. I got myself a light here. Hang on, I got two candles. They're both lit. Sometimes we as Christians say, I don't want to use up all my wax. <laughs> People know I'm a Christian. And, I, you know, and my, my light's out, but that doesn't mean I, I still got the ability to light up, you know? So anyhow, whenever you have a light, what do you do with it? You put it on a lampstand so you can light up the whole place. The light of the world. Jesus, later, Jesus talks about the people again saying, I am the light of the world. It includes a light. Did you know, I didn't know this. The Feast of Shelters includes a lamp lighting ritual that Jesus could have been referring to. So they knew about something in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, that came over to the New. Now, Light is defined as life. So we have salt as being purifying and, and an agent of, of healing and restoration and keeping, preserving. We all see that light is defined as life. The scripture says, in him, meaning Jesus, in him was life and the life was the light of men. The life of Jesus is the light of men. Okay? Now, did you get that up? What's that? Oh, well, I, can, I, can, I can read it. I got it. This is the coach of Clemson. If it comes up. What's that? Okay. The, now, Clemson. 
Clemson is now for those of you who are football fan, whatever you don't need to be. Don't need to be. Clemson uh, is rated the the number one college, um, number one football in in the program in the United States. Number two is I may have them backwards. South Carolina and three is Georgia. Those three schools are like Pitt, uh, West Virginia, and maybe Ohio State being at this end of the state of Ohio. So you've got three of the top people, top football programs in the nation within a couple hundred, within maybe a hundred miles, or I don't know what, wasn't, it's not very far. So the reason for the saying this is, everything that they do, especially Clemson at this time, when you're number one, everything that they do is scrutinized by the press, by the sports commentaries and writers and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Debo Swinley, that's his name, the coach. They ask him, <laughs> you know, what, what, his, what his goals are for the season. He says, his word for this season is purpose. I know what my purpose as a man is. That's to glorify God, to be a great husband and father, and use the game of football to equip young people for life. The most scrutinized coach in the United States in college football is this Swinney, Sweeney, S-W-I-N-N-E-Y. And he says that his purpose in life is to glorify God. And what he has done, he's put a big target on his back for everybody who is against Christians. <laughs> And if he in some way fails, people are going to be trying to blow out his light <laughs> and make mockery of his, of his faith. But that's not the point. The point is, we are to be the light of the world, and the light of the world is the life of Christ. The salt of the earth is the teachings we've learned from Christ. And the purity of our thoughts is that we don't steal, we don't cheat, we don't bear false, we, you know, those are the, the laws, but the purity of our heart is that if there are wrong thoughts, we ask God for forgiveness, make them right thoughts. You see, we are the light and we are the salt. Not because you've got to do this to be right with God, <laughs> the Ten Commandments. Do this and God will like you. No, we become this through Jesus Christ and that he walks with us, and these become who we are, not what we do. Amen? Remember who these people are. The people around the Sermon on the Mount. Moving from obey, obeying all the commands to being the salt and the light. You see, being responsible then as salt and light. We are being salt and light. We're not performing salt and light. Stand. <laughs> so, whatever our testimony is, whether we're the number one football program in the country, or whether we're the number one parent or grandparent or neighbor or person or the job or whomever we may, are, may be and wherever we are, we are the light. I didn't light it up, but we are the light, which is the life of Christ. We are the salt of the earth. And we, share, we give direction and we help purify and make the life that people are afraid of a little more palatable. God is in control. God, we thank you that you have given us this message, a message of being who you want us to be, and that we don't do this on our own. We become this in our relationship with you. So thank you, God, for hearing our prayer. Thank you, O oh God, for checking our mindset 
that we may see things more clearly and more lovingly and forgivingly. May we see the beauty that you see in us and may we see it in ourselves and in others. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Have a good holiday. And remember, take the lid off of the seasoning. Ha, 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 ha.